I started dreaming these audacious dreams, inspired by those wild National Geographic explorers. Those people and that magazine were what helped me to start crafting my own future by allowing me to step outside the box and live beyond the boundaries and confines of my gender, my culture, and all those other stereotypes that society had placed on me even before I could count backwards from 100. My love and affinity for water drew me into the ocean, and my curiosity grew. I knew that the ocean wasn't just a big blue tank of water, but instead, I knew it was a space of magic and adventure, and un a parallel universe that was tightly intertwined with my own. My fascination for this ecosystem, which comprises 70% of our planet and actually 98% of all livable space on Earth, was fueled by the likes of famed science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke, who used to sit and tell me these incredible stories about these skins that would swim past him in the watery depths. And every single time, he left me hanging, mouth agape and heart racing. And that's when I realized I was going to take things into my own hands and become a marine biologist. So when it was time to go off to university, I started telling people that I was going to study marine biology. And it seems like a natural choice. I come from a beautiful tropical island of Sri Lanka. But soon I started to realize that being a marine biologist from where I come from is almost unheard of. People started to ask me what I would do with my degree and if I would ever make any money. Other people were very resolute in the fact that I was never going to return home because clearly there was no scope for a marine biologist on a tropical island. I mean, I understand. You go to university, you invest in education, so culturally, I'm destined to become a doctor, lawyer, engineer, or a business person. Because those are useful careers that bring wealth, societal status, and of course, marriage. But as much as people tried to sway me, I stood resolute and adamant, and I said I would carve my own niche. Because here I was living on this island that was surrounded by one of the most underexplored basins in the world, ocean basins in the world. And to me, all I saw was potential, and nothing seemed impossible. Despite the fact that my family had given me these incredible gifts of independence and freedom and curiosity, the society that I lived in didn't allow my mind to soar to the heights that I really wanted it to. And then I went off to university in Scotland, and everything changed. For the first time, nobody was asking me not to ask questions in class because I would disrupt everybody else and baffle the teacher. And I wasn't being asked to memorize whole textbooks verbatim just to regurgitate them or at an exam that would test my memory and not my ability to philosophize. For the first time, I was being groomed to think, to know I had a valid point, and to understand that even fact is fluid and challengeable. And this gave me the comfort to actually question the prevailing norms in the marine conservation class that I was taking, which taught us a very protectionist stance, where all ecosystems and species had to be protected at all cost even at the cost of the livelihoods of the people who depended on that extraction of that resource. Coming from the global south and the so-called developing world, to me, this ideology represented a distinct disconnect from reality. Despite my obvious concern for the world's marine fish stocks, which you might need to know have declined, are either 85% of them are either fully exploited or overexploited. I couldn't even imagine telling my fishermen friends that they would have to stop fishing and therefore feeding, educating, and clothing their families just for the sake of a species of fish. That's when I realized that our conservation solutions had to have a human dimension because humans are an intricate part of nature. For me, what I was being taught made no sense. Because you know what? If we stopped all marine fisheries, where would 40% of our world's population get that primary source of protein? And 
What alternative income generating job would we give the billions of fishermen that we just put out of work? My desire to carve my own niche took me on many adventures. I have worked as a potato farmer, digging rotting potatoes out of fields to make money. I've lived in a tent for six months, and I've also worked on a whale research vessel that was circumnavigating the globe and stopping in the Maldives and Sri Lanka. I managed to wangle my way onto this boat by um, using my negotiation skills, my willingness to do absolutely anything, and sheer persistence. So much so that I actually wrote to the CEO of the company that owned the vessel every day for three months until they let me on for a two-week stint. And then through sheer hard work, uh, I convinced them that I was useful, and they kept me on for another six months as we sailed from the Maldives to Sri Lanka and then around my island home. This journey was where I had my eureka moment, when we were sailing along the southeastern coast of Sri Lanka, and we encountered a tight aggregation of blue whales and a floating pile of whale poop. So at university, I had been taught that large whales, like blue whales, undertook long-range migrations between cold feeding areas and warm breeding and calving areas. But here, I was faced with this incredibly beautiful red pile of poop, five degrees above the equator, in water as warm and as tropical as you can imagine. This was incredible, because obviously something weird was going on. These were waters that my textbooks had told me were too unproductive to support a population of these giants. This moment was what inspired the launch of the Sri Lankan Blue Whale Project, the first and only long-term research project on blue whales of the entire northern Indian Ocean Basin. These blue whales feed, breed, and carve in the northern Indian Ocean in these warm tropical waters and are considered non-migratory. They break the stereotypes that I'd been taught in university, that I'd learned in my textbooks, so I started calling them the unorthodox whales. They remind me that stereotypes are there to be challenged and broken, and that our knowledge of the oceans is still at its infancy. That's not surprising, because we've only explored less than 5% of our oceans. These blue whales live in busy, heavily used coastlines around Sri Lanka, yet till 2008, they remain relatively unknown. So to me, they're also very symbolic. Because if we know so little about a population of the largest animal that has ever lived on the planet, big and charismatic, they can capture the imagination of anyone of any age, then what hope is there for all those other smaller creatures that live in the oceans that we are yet to discover? The ocean is an incredible space. And my life is also tightly intertwined with these unorthodox whales, as I've gone on to break stereotypes that were bestowed on me in much the same way. But I don't see my job or my life as one that is only about saving whales. I actually see it as my job as something that involves saving our ocean and facing challenges that can help pave the way for others to join the field. To me, that's extremely important. Because after all, 70% of our coastlines are actually within the jurisdiction of developing countries. But if you go to any marine conservation gatherings, the representation by these countries is less than 10%. So the decisions about our oceans are being made by a handful of people who don't even represent the majority. As we all know, the one-size-fits-all model of conservation just doesn't work. What we need is tailor-made solutions to local problems that are identified by local teams of scientists who intimately know the people, the ecosystems, and the species because they actually live on the ground. We have to do away with what we call parachute science, where outsiders come into our countries, do work and leave and take everything with them. And legacies should come in the form of people inspired and trained, and not the number of journal articles published. Yeah. 
Because equality and inclusivity is what is going to allow us to actually save these oceans. Not a lot else. And it's not that hard. Because the ocean isn't a series of isolated puddles of water that are exclusive to only certain countries. They're actually, it's actually one big continuous water mass. So what happens in your corner of the globe actually impacts my corner of the globe. And as much as we like to say all roads lead to Rome, the reality is that all waterways lead to the ocean. What we need right now is an army. The idea that you have to have a university degree to be able to contribute to conservation is archaic and detrimental to our progress. Every single person has the potential to be part of the solution and not just part of the problem. Because after all, the ocean is a vast space. And so if 70% of our planet is ocean, why isn't at least 50% of our world population working for the ocean to create sustainability and to ensure that we keep it intact for future generations. The ocean has been an alien place for far too long. We need more people to be talking about it in everyday conversation. We need to quell that unhealthy fear that people have for the oceans, like in places like Sri Lanka, and replace that with respect and curiosity. When we ask kids about important places and monuments in the ocean, why are they not saying Challenger Deep, the deepest point on Earth, which is actually deeper or taller than Mount Everest? Or why are we not talking about Hanifaru Bay in the Maldives, where you can witness the largest gathering of manta rays in the world? Or why aren't we taking a step back in history to dive sites like the Wreck of the Hermes, which was the first ever purpose-built aircraft carrier in the world that was sunk off eastern Sri Lanka. To me, I find it extremely strange that we know more about outer space than we do about our own planet. We managed to get, you know, 12 people walking on the moon. That's 400,000 kilometers away from where we are right now. Yet, only three people have managed to get down to Challenger Deep, which is here at our doorstep. I don't know, does it make sense? We are at a really crucial juncture in human history. The World Wildlife Fund's Living Planet Report told us that between 1970 and 2012, just four decades, our marine vertebrate populations declined by 50%. The problem here is that when we when we, these populations decline, they disrupt the marine food webs and ocean ecosystem functioning. One of the greatest examples of how vertebrates are really important in the ocean ecosystem is what we call the whale pump. Essentially, all whales will dive to the depths to feed in areas where there are nutrients that are limiting in surface waters. So they feed, and after they do so, they rise to the surface to breathe, because like all mammals, they have to, they're air breathing. As they do so, they release these giant fecal plumes that are chock full of those nutrients that they fed on at depth. The availability of sunlight and nutrients in the surface waters means that tiny microscopic plants called phytoplankton can then start to grow and proliferate. And as they do so, they photosynthesize and release oxygen into the atmosphere. Think about it. About 70% of the oxygen we breathe is generated by plants in the ocean, some of which is fertilized by whale poop. <laughs> Our generation has a grand opportunity to leave this planet a better place than we found it. But to do so, we have to remember that as much as we want other people to respect us in our spaces and our homes, we have to learn to extend that respect to other species in their homes, like the marine fauna in the oceans that they live in. For us to carve a sustainable future for our oceans, we have to start inspiring people, sharing stories, and making sure everyone sees themselves as an agent of change. Because we do need everyone 
The ocean, remember, is a giant place. And none of this can be done in isolation. We do have to work together because the ocean is a continuous water mass. To me, the ocean is the final frontier and we don't have a backup plan. We might invest millions of dollars in trying to find this alternative planet that we can call home once we've destroyed Mother Earth, but to be fair, right now, we're not finding it fast enough and we're going to have to live in the squalor and mess of our own wrongdoings unless we stop now and start caring for the only home that we truly have. Because look around you, what we have here is real. And everything else is just a mere fantasy. We have to start living in the present, in the now. I believe that together we can craft a sustainable future for our oceans. Are you all prepared to join me on this great adventure for the sake of the oceans and humanity? Thank you.